This is The Secret of Kells, the first feature film from the five-time Oscar-nominated studio Cartoon Saloon in Kilkenny, Ireland. Right out the gate, these guys were turning heads, and they've been nominated for an Academy Award for every feature film since. I sat down with director and co-founder of the studio, Tom Moore, to learn more about directing for animation. This is that conversation. You know, some years back now, you and Paul Young and Nora Twomey founded Cartoon Saloon. Um, obviously, right out the gate, you're gonna be a much smaller operation uh, than you have become today. And so I'm curious, you know, in terms of, you know, animation, what did directing look like for you guys back then? Yeah, directing, I think for me, was a bit of a necessary evil. I think when we set up the studio, I kind of wanted to, you know, obviously tell my own stories and all, but I also liked the idea of working in a team and getting to animate and draw and design a lot, you know. And so, um, honestly, when we first set up, directing could mean just doing everything yourself or doing most of it with some help. Um, maybe the first experience I saw of directing uh, on any kind of a scale was uh, some of Nora's short films. And uh, she would have supervised the storyboards or done them herself, posed out most of the key poses for the scene um, over the layouts. She worked closely with her husband and he was a background artist and a storyboard artist. And then she would have given us scenes to animate. And uh, sometimes she took them back and like corrected them herself. And, you know, it was very, like simple and controlled like that. And then also she would have worked with one or two other people to composite it and paint everything too. So it was really like, we're talking like maybe eight, maybe 10 people max for those projects early on. Wow, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. You talk about making some key poses. It reminds me honestly of some of the Looney Tunes guys, Chuck Jones, yeah. Guys, yeah. Keys. Um, and then honestly, in terms of kind of correcting some of those uh, drawings is, it's somewhat Hayao Miyazaki. Um, yeah. That's some scenes and kind of. Yeah. Stuff that grew out of necessity, I started to realize did have a precedent because I would talk to other animation directors in, in Ireland who were maybe doing commercials. And when we were doing commercials, we started doing the thing that we were advised to do by Paul Bulger. He's another Irish animator who'd worked for Don Bluth and everything. And he would do, yeah, we would do the poses, key poses. Uh, for the animators or not key poses but like layout poses like okay. ex big expressions or not not like you know the animator could still change them but uh, also a thing called scene illustrations which was really important and it's become really important of how i direct to where we would make not just concept art but an attempt at what the final image would look like with effects animation character animation using photoshop to kind of composite or simulate what we could do and because early on we were just using after effects and stuff it was pretty easy to mimic what we'd done in photoshop with after effects so we would show the client before we started the production what the final thing would look like and it would kind of reassure them but then as Nora and I started directing our own projects we would do that to reassure ourselves and we'd always have that to point to and I mean sometimes the compositing team would come up with something better but we had at least a baseline that okay this is what it's going to look like and I think it was something special about hand-drawn for us that you could kind of start with an illustration and understand pretty well how you'd get that look on screen there was no kind of like oh can the computer handle fur or anything like that it was just you could figure out the line mileage and everything else that was needed just from an illustration. That's very interesting. Um, so obviously after a period of time, uh, I, I suppose um, what, maybe 10 years or so, uh, yeah. you guys um, got to start to work on your first feature film, which was The Secret of Kells. Uh, how did you sort of convince investors that you guys were ready to do a feature and, and how did you get that going and about? Um, so the first... The first maybe five years of the studio was kind of just trying to pay the bills and stay in business. And we did everything from illustrating, you know, the, the new syllabus for the schools, you know, and uh, CD-ROMs and e-cards or whatever we could get to pay the bills in the early 2000s. But we also did um, chunks of feature films for other European studios. So if they were in trouble. We might take like five minutes to animate and uh, in that way we learned a lot in, about the industry and we met other people in the industry and something we did early on was we went to uh, 
cartoon movie, which is like a forum in, in France, it was in Germany at the time, for European producers to pitch their ideas and meet other partners. And so we pitched our project pretty early on. And uh, Didier Brunner is a French producer who was making the triplets of Belleville at the time. It's one of the first European features to kind of break through into the Oscars and all. But he was in the middle of producing that, I think, in 2003. And uh, he kind of believed in us. You know, he took us under his wing and he had a co-production partner in Belgium. And he kind of taught us how it would work, that you raise as much money as you can in each European country. But under the EU co-production treaty, it would all kind of be pooled in a way that, you know, they would do some work in France, we do some work in Ireland, they do some work in Belgium. And then uh, we started co-producing that way, other people's projects, and then eventually got our own project off the ground with DDA as a French producer. His, his track record was good already in Europe, and his partner Vivian van Fletteren was a quite experienced producer too. And he produced a movie called Kirikou and the Saucers, which had been a pretty big hit in France. And so with him involved, we kind of quickly started to secure financers in France. And that kind of ironically gave Irish financing partners confidence that we were just like a bunch of, because we were like, I think I was 23 at the time. So, you know, we were really young. And by the time we got into production, I was 27, you know. So it took a long time, but bit by bit, by working on other projects and by partnering up with more experienced producers like DDA, um, we kind of, Frank and financed it, bits and pieces of finance from here and there. It got going around 2005, yeah. Now, in terms of directing Secret of Kells, you know, being your first picture, you co-directed that with Nora. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. By the time we got into production, she had directed shorts and I still had only directed commercials and a few little experiments and things. So I felt I needed her, her chops on my side. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I was curious. I went back and watched um, From Darkness. Um, yeah. and it seems, uh, I mean, I know this is an earlier film, but it seems even just the sensibilities that she has, uh, she's, a, she's a strong director and storyteller in oh, her own yeah. right. Uh, yeah. And I'm sort of curious, you know, with the kind of melding of what she brings to the table and you bring to the table, I'm kind of curious kind of what that looked like working with her. Uh, I think Nora, um, uh, yeah, she's a very strong filmmaker and she brought a lot even to the storyboarding and we worked with the screenwriter for Brie Silkowski to rework the story when she came involved as we were working through the storyboards. Um, Nora was very kind of humble about it in that it had been my project from very early on and I'd originally been going to co-direct it with another guy, Aidan Hart, but he in the meantime I'd created a series called Skunk Fu. He was busy with Skunk Fu. And uh, Nora was willing to help me, but she was kind of like in that Pixar way, kind of the co-pilot, but she let me have the, the final say, let's say, but I, I listened to her and we talked things out a lot. I would rarely overrule her, but she kind of left that hierarchy in place that I was a little bit the, more the final say than her. And um, she took care of a lot of the animation direction, like everything from X sheets to, you know, and voice direction, she was, she brought a lot to it because she did all the scratch voices until we recorded the actors and then she came to the the recording of the actors with me so we did that together so we did a lot together and then at a certain point she took um, some time out and um, she um, had her first child and then I was kind of on my own for a little while for about a year or maybe less and then she came back and was able to rejoin in the final part where we were like mixing the sound and getting the music and everything final score and all done so she was a major part of the whole production and the only caveat i'd say was that we kind of agreed it early on to do that sort of director co-director thing which for that production was the right thing to do because i'd been carrying it on my own for quite a while um yeah yeah no that's interesting that makes sense um one of the things that i think is really striking not just to me but obviously um to the whole world. I mean, when you guys released The Secret of Kells, you made a splash um, Academy Award nomination right out the gate, <laughs> which is really, crazy. really Absolutely uh, crazy, yeah. Something. But uh, I think what's, I mean, you've heard this before, the style you guys settled on for this particular picture uh, being inspired by kind of the pages of the Illuminators. Um, it's very, very flat in a lot of places, yeah. very, very graphic. Um, and it makes me sort of one of the questions that I would have, I think, approaching this particular project uh, is in animation, <laughs> is this going to work? Um, yeah. You know, and 
was that where you lean more heavily on scene illustrations or, or how did you yeah. answer the question is this going to work um we've done a lot of work or like we were so naive starting out that we thought we could make it all on our own so we'd we'd spent about a year trying to make it and we ended up with sort of a lot of test scenes and a kind of a promo trailer and stuff that we brought the cartoon movie and it wasn't quite as stylized then but it was pretty stylized and i think right from the start i was coming at it my friend ross stewart who was the art director on Secret of Cows. He co-directed Wolf Walkers with me and I had been school friends. So we were quite, our manifesto was animation can do anything you can draw, you can animate, you know, and we were really inspired by people like Richard Williams and stuff saying that. So that was very much what we wanted to do. And when Aidan had been involved, he was another very strong voice, illustrative wise, and a great team of designers. And we were very much a studio that was talking about and thinking about what could hand-drawn animation do in the face of CG in the face of the fact that hand-drawn animation was kind of evolving into a more CG look and the CG look at the time meant Pixar kind of hyper-realism and we were thinking could we go in a different direction so all of that was part of who we were when DDA and the other partners got involved so they were kind of trusting us to be able to pull it off and in fact DDA was impressing upon us that our only chance to stand out would be to look as different from Disney as possible you know we worked with a Hungarian studio that I really admired, the Keskimit Film Studio, who had done a lot of beautiful work with Hungarian folk art. And so that was kind of what the project was about. Not to say that everyone trusted in it, and a lot of people that worked on it were not sure if it was going to work. And we had to spend a long time doing a lot of pre-production designing and planning. We did scene illustrations, but also like thick books of rules and do's and don'ts and a lot of animation testing and yeah it was a it was a long period i'd say from the time we set up the studio over 99 2000 to the time we started production in 2005 we had sort of had an opportunity to try a lot of stuff out and also to kind of prove ourselves with the style and actually we had a bit too many styles i remember sitting a cartoon movie the year we were starting production and the head of the irish film board and dda and i think our partner in canal plus in france literally sat with our graphic bible of of how we wanted the movie to look and they started ripping pages out saying look this is too much you're going too far crazy you're trying too many different things we need to unify the style and um that's what ross and i worked on the last year 2004 trying to get the finance locked in in place was when we made the final graphic bible that was a bit more uh scene illustrations rather than concept like where we were kind of locking in the style and doing tests and things like that that's interesting. You talk about needing to unify the style because even in the finished version, you have some mm. uh, different style treatments. Specifically, yeah. the Vikings and things when they come, there's a little bit of a different style than. It's you know, kind of been. It's kind of become our calling card that we do kind of. Like we always loved the art of books and we always hated that everything got kind of watered down, and we kind of became known for people that would experiment and innovate. You know, with different styles within a project. You know. Uh, yeah, I do think that's one of the coolest things about uh, the art of books that come out of Cartoon Saloon is that they're just full of pages and pages of art, just yeah. and less, uh, you know, less copy, which is nice. <laughs> we're always, we're always like excited to share art. Like even back then, I had a blog I called it the Blog of Cows, and I was just excited to share everything I was doing. I was just enthusiastic. It was the absolute opposite of a big American corporation where everything would be under wraps. I was just like, look what we're doing, and just. You know, pre-Instagram, anything else, blog blogger was my place that I kind of shared. And, and I met so many friends and supporters in the industry that way. You know, people, before the movie came out, there was people who knew about it because they'd been following my blog, which was absolute opposite of the way that, you know, things would have been marketed before, where you didn't breathe a word about it until it all hit. And it had sort of been teased over the years, so... Yeah, it was great. We had friends in Pixar and DreamWorks and different big studios in the States excited for it, you know? Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Now, in terms of uh, Kells, um, it, the, some of the influences that I've heard you mention in, pre, in various places before, um, you know, you guys put a lot of detail into your into your picture. I mean, you guys talked about uh, flowers that show up in the movie that are, that are native to Ireland or bugs, beetles that are native yeah. to Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, you know, influences you guys looked at the book of kells um, yeah. but also some some in, you know places of influence that i wouldn't have anticipated um like animal farm you guys talked about um in the abbot's abbot's room yeah um, calvin and Hobbes a little bit like yeah yeah so kind of where do you find <laughs> your sources of inspiration how do they all inform your 
directing. Yeah, The Animal Farm book by Ralph Steadman we really loved. I think what it was was like Paul, who's a partner in the studio as well, um, studied illustration and we were all really passionate about comics and illustration. And I think our style ended up becoming this like percolation where it started like a very wide funnel and kind of percolated down into kind of an espresso of all the stuff we loved. And um, and uh, I think the early concept art, I think the DDA and the Irish Film Board guy were right. You know, we were going all over the map and playing with it, but I think we found a way to make rules around it so that if, you know, like Calvin and Hobbes, we love the ink and watercolor style in the kind of main pages in those books, which are a little bit like the carpet pages in the Book of Kells. It was like a, a big watercolor page and then you got into the detail. And um, yeah, all of that stuff, it all just kind of percolated down and the style kind of, and we were being pushed in a certain direction too, but by the source material, like it needed to feel like medieval art and stuff. So we had to discard things that weren't, that weren't speaking to that kind of aesthetic you know so yeah but yeah I think the trick with finding a style is to look as diverse as possible and take your inspiration from as wide as possible and that way you don't get accused of just copying one style but rather creating something new by remixing everything you love. Interesting um, one of the things that struck me when I saw Secret of Kells is that portions of it um, are a little bit more abstracted than others Specifically, uh, Krom Kruik was mm. uh, was a fairly abstract portion of the of the picture, and I was curious, you know, how do you, how did you come to those decisions? This is going to be a little bit more abstracted, and this is going to be more literal. Like, how did you make those decisions? Um, well, the Krom Kruik sequence actually, I I used to have a trick that was almost a little bit like shamanism or something. When I would be half awake and half asleep, I would play the sequence in my head and then get up and storyboard it as fast as possible. That sequence I had thumbnailed out one sleepless night and then the assistant director, Remy Chaillet, storyboarded it based on my thumbnails. But what we'd done was we'd, we'd attend, I'd attended this lecture by a guy called Bruce Block who talks about the visual story and how different parts of the, of the visuals are all like music that you can orchestrate ahead of time. So we made a kind of chart and one of the things was like flat and decorative. And and we would, with the chart, kind of plot the story and go, OK, when things are, let's say, safe or close to being in Brendan's imagination, let's go really flat. When things are dangerous and a little bit too real, let's go really deep and get into perspective. And then we would say colour wise, let's have lots of colour when Brendan feels safe and let's have less and less colour. So at the point when the Vikings attack, it's just, you know, black and white and red and in Crom's cave it's somewhere in the middle so everything was kind of plotted and charted that way as a broad thumbnail of it and we also had a shape language chart where we were getting more um, three-dimensional and more flat or more angular or more curved and all that stuff so we tried to figure that all out ahead of time in a kind of very rough thumbnail roadmap and then you just have to just trust you. like you can't be too prescriptive or it looks very calculated it would seem very like kind of pre-programmed but it just gave us a map or guideline um for how we went it to go but like definitely when you're in the realm of dreams or imagination um and like animation hand-drawn animation can very easily go there it doesn't seem like such a big jump to go from the real world to you know a flatter more dreamlike space that's when you're into kind of archetypes and images that are almost like pictographs or something really ancient, you know? So you're kind of playing with Brendan in the Crom cave is still drawn relatively three-dimensionally, but Crom is always represented as a very um, kind of abstract image. And we kind of kept it in the world of Brendan's imagination where the Vikings were a real threat. So they moved much more in three dimensions, you know? Yeah. That is, um, that's really, that's really insightful. Very interesting. Can you talk a little bit about shape language? Uh, you mentioned shape a little bit. Um, and I know that uh, your pictures are quite heavily stylized in terms of shapes and things. Um, yeah, visual language. Yeah. I think it's when you're working on a budget and you don't have, you're not certain. I mean, like the animation was good, but it was all being divided up between different studios and stuff. So we thought, if we could tell the story as strongly as possible with visual language, 
color and shapes and stuff, at least the story would work. And then the animation could be better or worse, depending on how good a team we could find and how well we directed them. But we felt we had a lot of control over the story by using the shape language. And so because we were speaking to the language of medieval art and shape language was a big part of that. There was even kind of codes within it that a modern audience wouldn't pick up on. Like we drew the abbot really big because usually in medieval art, the main character, like the Jesus figure or whatever was huge. And then all the other characters were small. So we did a lot of playing with the kind of language of medieval art in animation. But yeah, it was really basic stuff. Like it was just like, you know, what, what shapes felt safe and secure. So we had these like low Romanesque semicircle shapes. And then what seemed more austere were like the Gothic shapes of cathedrals. So we kind of based that around the abbot and the Vikings are all angular and dark with like rough edges. And, you know, we kind of just had a, a plan um, in big broad terms, what shapes meant what. And then we just played with that. You know, we were just playing with the fact that Pangor Bond, the cat, his head is at semicircle, so is Brother Aidan's, you know, so is the scriptorium, and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and one of the things you guys have been really, really, um, really good at, I think, is marrying historic with lore, with religion. I mean, Secret of Kells, on, you, on the one hand, you have this uh, historic, ancient, religious book in the Book of Kells, yeah. um, but you guys really played with a lot of the lore um, with Ashlyn, um, in those things. Um, but even, you know, moving into, you know, wolf walkers, you have historic figures like Oliver Cromwell, um, mm -hmm. but these fantastical things, you know, who, who really did um, sort of mandate that let's get rid of these wolves, but you have these <laughs> fantastical elements of little girls who turn into wolves. Yeah. How, are, how are you maintaining that that balance is so well um, worked out? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I remember early in my career, I met a storyteller I really admired, Eddie Lenehan, and he kind of retells ancient Irish stories for this generation, or at least my generation when I was a kid. He's still going, though, so still has an impact. And he sort of felt like these are our stories that we can retell, and he retells them differently every time he talks to a different audience, you know, and he mixes up, you know, St. Patrick with... I don't know, Fionn McCool or Coo Cullen, like an ancient pagan kind of hero. And, you know, he'll throw in references to modern stuff and he keeps it kind of fun and interesting by mixing everything up and keeping it relevant to the audience. And I think that's what it was for us. We were just sort of kind of, it's kind of the water we were swimming in. It's just kind of our, our upbringing. And I even feel it for myself spiritually at a certain point, I kind of was very, um, disappointed and disillusioned with the Catholic Church but I was raised Catholic and I looked at the kind of intersection between paganism and Catholicism that I'd grown up with and started to see that there was like a deeper older truth that was in the teachings that were separate to the organized religion that I'd grown up with you know and so I started looking at the, the older roots of like pagan spirituality that ran through Irish culture and so I think that mix that weird mixture where we have saints that were originally pagan gods and we have holy places that were originally like fairy forts but then became like a, a, a Christian place of worship and all like that it all just felt natural to mix all that up with a little bit of a light touch rather than to be too like reverential and you know we weren't like coming from that kind of point of view yeah no, that's very interesting as I said it's a, it's such an interesting um perspective because it it doesn't feel irreverent necessarily mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a viewer but um neither does it feel um wholesale all in it's 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 a yeah. cool <laughs> we also as in Didier is very interesting character in that you know he's Jewish guy French guy very interested in art history and the art history of the church in particular because that's part of the story of art in Europe is mixed up with the church and he helped us you know, the first drafts of the script and stuff before Fabrice came in might have been a bit too Irish Catholic. And he kind of helped us make a more universal story. Huh. Now, uh, one of the things that I've noticed about um, your guys' pictures that come out is you leave me wanting, you almost start me on a quest um, to learn more. <laughs> you must go.
when I left the Secret of Kells, I I went and said, "What is this Book of Kells?" And I went and looked it right. up. You know, and, right. and after Song of the Sea, you're like, "Selkie, is that a thing?" Yeah. What, you know, <laughs> the these guys make it up. But even Wolf Walkers, I was I was <laughs> googling, you know, uh, you, gosh, who's Oliver Cromwell and what what <laughs> thing? Um, but I think that there's something really sort of elemental about the way you guys tell stories in that you introduce your audience to this idea you somehow allude to there's more here uh, so that I, as the viewer, go looking for it. Um, whereas I think it's, you know, it's easy to have kind of the reverse of you come into this fantastical story, you get everything there and you walk away saying, okay, what's next? Uh, and I'm just sort of curious, um, is there, <laughs> does that just come naturally to you or is there some way that you're sort of, are you holding, are you holding back some things? Um, no, sort of I think, I, I think we're I think um I think if I was looking at any other movies, it would be like the Ghibli movies that give me a little flavor or taste of Japanese culture, but I never knew what was actually part of Japanese Shinto religion and what was just the whimsy of Miyazaki or Takahata, you know. And I'd have to research afterwards to find out. So I always liked that, you know. And I, I like whenever you try and tell a story that is relatively complete in itself but if you're curious there's more and more to find and I think it's also because they take so long to make they end up layered they end up with lots of layers in there you know because you kind of have to you go from a very specific uh, idea and then over the iterations of retelling the story stuff falls into the background which in itself would be quite interesting like on Wolf Walker's there was, a, there was like every movie we make, I feel like there's 10 movies we could have made with that subject matter and you have to pick one. And so like Oliver Cromwell and the story between him and and the hunter, uh, Bill Goodfellow, Robin's dad, there was a whole other movie in there and that was interesting too. Or who were the people who were cursed by Patrick to become wolf walkers, you know? And even the story of St. Patrick cursing the pagans to be wolf walkers, like all of that stuff. There was so much in there. So it kind of gives a richness to it because you're like, okay, we know all of this, but let's just focus in on this little part of it. And um, yeah, well, my my dream, my hope would be that other people pick it up and tell other stories because they're like Eddie. Eddie Lenhan retells the stories, you know, and they're old, old stories are from an oral tradition. They get retold for a different audience every time. So you're just in the middle kind of picking the bit that interests you and that you think is important to communicate. But all the other stuff is still there and someone else might draw those threads out. You know. Oh, interesting. Uh, now, after Secret of Kells, you um, kind of went on to do a solo project, which was the Song of the Sea. Mm -hmm. And um, Nora also went off and did a project which she directed solo, which was the Breadwinner. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of curious um, for the pair of you, you know, who are friends, who are co-founders of the studio, who are directors at the studio, going off to direct um, feature films by yourselves, um, both of them Oscar nominees. <laughs> <laughs> um, what what was that like, you know, for you now to go into? Okay, I'm doing Song of the Sea, you know, and I'm and I'm not leaning on Nora in the same capacity, or at least not with the same credit, and and watching yeah. her sort of go off and do sort of another picture. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I helped Nora as much with Breadwinner as she helped me with Song of the Sea. So I think she was very complete in herself as a filmmaker, where she helped me a lot with Song of the Sea. I mean, she was kind of involved very much in like the storyboarding of Song of the Sea, more as a kind of story editor and Song of the Sea and she helped with the voice recording and then then she stepped away from the project and I did the rest more or less on my own but I would always look to her for her opinion and take her opinion on board about every aspect of it and in Breadwinner I was a little bit involved in storyboarding and stuff early on but not much of what I did ended up in the movie and she kind of did her own thing so at least for me Song of the Sea was quite close to how we worked on Secret of Kells, but just not as intensely for as long. She helped me a lot during the story process and the voice directing, and then kind of stood back and I felt pretty confident with the rest of it. And I always feel like on Song of the Sea, I had a lot of co-directors, but they were just like, she was head of story. Dara Byrne was the editor, but he was like another co-director at times. And, you know, Fabian Erlinghauser was like the animation supervisor, but he was like another co-director. So I kind of felt like at different stages in the production, especially Adrian Merjo, the art director, we were kind of on a journey all the way through the project where I was very heavily relying on one collaborator, but I was the common thread, you know, 
through all the production. So during storyboards, Nora was very important. Through the whole visual side of it, Adrian was very important, you know, and, and so on. Yeah, oh, that's very interesting. Um, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, so in Song of the Sea, um, well, first of all, I think all of your pictures have very nuanced characters, which I think is, um, is refreshing, it's wonderful. Um, they're so sort of well-rounded that I'm not sitting there thinking, um, where's the strong female lead or where's the whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Like a Miyazaki mm -hmm. film, I'm just wrapped up in the story and I don't really care about how it's packaged necessarily. Um, one of the things I thought was interesting when you have more complex nuanced characters is you can have them behave in ways that are, uh, well, so for instance, you know, in uh, Song of the Sea, you have the little boy who's, um, he's sort of mean to his sister. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you don't, he's not unlikable. It doesn't feel like the way he relates to her in forever. You know, it mm -hmm. feels it feels more authentic to here is a boy who's still mourning the loss of his mother. Yeah, um, and in some presenting ways, the sister for that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. She arrived. She arrived. The mom disappeared. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But even some more. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, even similarly in Kells, you know, you have the abbot who begins as this sort of sort of nasty figure, sort of overlooking. But you begin to realize that he really does care yeah. about Brendan. Yeah. Um, and even in Wolfwalkers, you know, Maeve is sort of this wild child. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what I'm saying is the character flaws that you give to your your major characters often there's a trap that these flaws will feel like this is the lesson they need to learn by the end of the picture. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But in a cartoon saloon picture, um, they don't feel that way. They feel uh -huh. like um, just nuances to these complex characters. Um, and I guess sort of how do you go about creating these characters who are very often strong female leads without making them feel like stock, flat characters um, and re remaining likable? Yeah. I don't know. It's a million dollar question. I don't know if I'll do it again. I was just lucky. It's like an alchemy of amazing collaborators, whether it was through Brees writing Kells or Will Collins writing Song of the Sea and Wolfwalkers and Ross, my co-director in Wolfwalkers, Nora. Just everybody, I think, really cared about getting that stuff right. And it's such a long journey to make these things. You sort of have to pack the characters with people, you, you know, aspects of people you love, you know, and, and of yourself and all. So think it's about trying to be pretty honest and I don't know it's funny because like I say collaborators are really important and they are but on the other hand it's really important that you get to have a final say I think what goes wrong sometimes is everybody with the best of intentions can turn into a committee and everybody tries to say it and then it becomes really obvious that these are characters that were created from sets of notes and I see that a bit where I kind of call it story science, where you can tell this has been storied, you know, with all these, you know, PhDs in screenwriting, you know, and executives and, you know, people with the best of intentions and they all feed into it. And then you kind of watch it and it feels like the screenwriting book manual playing out in front of you, you know, and it loses some authenticity. So you kind of have to be open to collaboration and at the same time not get too lost in taking notes from everybody or trying to apply those notes in a way that would get you top grades in screenwriting class or whatever. Because I think a movie is more than a, a script, you know, and a script can get very didactic and this has to happen and for that to happen. And you can get lost in that stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, certainly. <clears throat> yeah, as I said, I think um, some studios that, that do give me some hope and, and um, just faith, I think our, our Cartoon Saloon, but also Studio Ghibli, because, mm -hmm. you know, we get to encounter people yeah. uh, and i mean jibby stuff can sometimes be confounding and doesn't always work but i always respect the earnestness you know even if i'm watching it i go ah oh, he's losing me a bit here with all this whimsy and stuff and kind of respect that more than feeling like i've been kind of i'm watching something so committee scripted that i can almost predict everything that's going to happen i kind of i respect an earnest failure more than a kind of competent um over over calculated success <laughs> yeah sure uh so uh the character ben in um song of the sea he uh <laughs> as soon as i saw him <laughs> your attention to detail is wonderful i mean i thought here is someone who understands <laughs> little boys I and mean, he's got the 3d <laughs> glasses as part of this <laughs> the life fest or whatever in the cave yeah. You've encapsulated boyhood, I think, in this character design. 
Um, are <laughs> do you guys just are you just sort of that careful with every level of detail when you go into every project? Because it does seem like you t you approach each of these pictures in a different way uh, in terms of, of filling out the that detail. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Definitely Ben was um, based on my own son, Ben. It was a very personal movie, so I'm going to see a lot of me and Will Collins, the writer, and my own son made Ben, you know, and my relationship with my sister was in there and stuff. And so a lot of those details, even the little chipped tooth and stuff, were all from my son, you know, and the way he behaved. And Will and I would ask ourselves questions sometimes about the character. And, and uh, usually we kind of just knew from instincts. You know, it was a little boy who was 10 in 1987 and we'd both been 10 in 1987 so we kind of could answer the questions of the character you know having lived it you know yeah oh that's fantastic um and so then moving into wolf walkers uh, which is your most recent um picture wolf wolf hunt them far and yonder forest is brimming with wolves. It's my job to hunt them down, not yours. But we could hunt them together. Wolves, bears, dragons even. <laughs> <laughs> She's one of them wolf walkers. Wolf walkers? Wait! The ones that can talk to wolves with some wild magic. We can come out now. We can smell ya, you stick. You're a uh, wolf walker. You're a wolf when you sleep. <gasps> what? A girl when you're awake. <laughs> Robin, something's happened to me. Yeah, I can see that. It's flipping great. You're a wolf now. Be a wolf. Are getting smaller every day. These wolves, they're just beasts. Tonight we put an end to this. I promise your mother I'd keep you safe. I have to help her. Wolfwalkers, uh, from my point of view, sort of encapsulates um, Cartoon Saloon because when I look at your pictures, the two things that I come away with are you guys love animation. I mean, you really love it and you love Ireland. Um, everything feels like a love letter to both of those things. Uh, Wolfwalkers especially felt like just a love letter to animation. Um, yeah, and hand-drawn animation in particular. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. The things that you... I remember when I started watching it and um, a lot of the line work was so clean. Um, and I remember <laughs> wondering if I was watching the right version because in the trailer, I'd seen all the sketchy sort of yeah. scratchy lines. And then as I'm watching, I realized, oh my goodness, when they're in the town and things are more buttoned up, the line is much cleaner and when they're out and free. Um, yeah, so that yeah. made sense. But those are the kinds of decisions that you guys made. Um, another thing where, which would yeah. beg the question, is this going to work? Yeah, yeah. How did you guys? Yeah, I like it. Those I like I like kind of wandering out a little bit into the deep end and taking risks like that. Especially, you know, it keeps it kind of fresh. If we just did everything the same way over and over again, you would get a bit, you know, tired. But I like trying stuff out. And what I liked about Wolfwalkers is we had, you know, we had great partners, our co-production partners, and Apple. Um, so we had a chance to be a little bit more like some of our style on Secret of Kells was also a function of budget you know that we could only work we you know you could only do what you could do but we actually had the budget i felt on wolf walkers to try something more experimental and more daring and that's why i thought it would be fun to to push the line work and everything as well as the stuff we, we normally do and the animation too but uh, yeah i mean it's definitely a love letter to kilkenny where ross and i grew up and it's our home and uh, hand-drawn animation we really wanted to get that 
when you talk about Ghibli, like the tale of Princess Kaguya had really shown me like, oh, there's a language to the line that we haven't been utilizing. And, you know, CG animation, like I'm not against it. In fact, they might use a, a, a type of CG animation more and more like Moho, that kind of cut animation. But when I saw Into the Spider-Verse, we were in the middle of, of Wolf Walkers. And I was like, wow, finally I'm seeing like a mainstream CG using the whole language of comics and animation and everything that can be done. And it just kind of felt like they had thrown down the gauntlet that we, you know, anything that anybody had ever thought was a bit crazy or that we were trying something too experimental visually, I could point them at into the Spider-Verse and say, well, look, we're not even going half as far as these guys. So that was, that was great to see. And I felt like we were part of a kind of, hopefully a maturing of the visual language of family features where shorts and experimental stuff had been experimenting with those things for a long time but now features for a mainstream audience are becoming more and more savvy to what can be done besides hyper realism and uh, yeah it felt exciting and frustrating seeing stuff that I'd always wanted to do you know, play out on screen in Spider-Verse it's like ah <laughs> Yeah, I thought the same thing when I saw Spider Verse. I thought, man, you know, if I, someone's actually experimenting with this this particular medium. Um, I'm curious. You know, you'd worked with Russ Stewart as uh, art designer on Secret of Kells, but on Wolf Walkers, he was your co-director. Yeah. What? Um, how was that different, and what was that like to sort of shift him into a different role, or was he just doing more? And and what was that yeah. like? The credits in Cartoon Saloon from the very beginning are, have been somewhat. Um, they never quite did justice to everything everybody did you know there wasn't really limits to where people would get involved so in a way Ross could have been seen as yet another co-director on Secret of Kells. During Song of the Sea he was working in Leica but he had done some concept art with us and when he came back from Leica I'd been asked to do a part of The Prophet um, which was a feature that Selma Hayek was producing and Roger Allers was directing. I asked Ross to co-direct that with me you know because I think by then he he felt he was ready to direct, he wanted to direct and he'd been a kind of gun for hire designer in Leica and stuff. Um, but now he kind of was home again and wanted to be more involved. And I was making Song of the Sea at the same time as we were doing The Prophet, finishing it anyway. And so I needed the help. So I asked him to co-direct that. So that worked out fine. And then we literally sat down and said, let's come up with a project to co-direct together. And uh, it was really different than Secret of Kells. It was split right down the middle because right from the beginning, it was both our idea and we tried to do everything together. I mean, at a certain point in production, we I focused more on animation and character design. He focused a bit more on backgrounds and stuff, but we still checked each other's work. But everything else we did, you know, in tandem and agreed on everything together. And it felt very natural for the most part. Yeah, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, just, you know, flipping through the, uh, the art of Wolf Walker's book. I mean, you get a sense that there's just a lot of synergy and a lot of camaraderie and a lot of, you guys are each bringing a lot to the table uh, to sort of come yeah, up yeah. with a, this. We both, um, you know, because we've been growing up together and we were, you know, passionate fans of animation and comics and stuff as teenagers and kids. And then in animation school and then into Secret of Cows, there was so many things we talked about and we felt, OK, let's make this the big triple decker sandwich where we just pack in all the stuff we've always wanted to play with into one project. So we were like, oh, do you remember we were going to use ink splats to show anger? Oh, yeah, let's do that. Or, you know, it, that was felt like that. It felt like let's go for it. And it's also left us with a big question mark what we do next, because it's kind of like it was deliberately designed as the last hurrah of this style. And now we're kind of going, oh, and it's exciting again because we're like, what will we do next now that we've done everything we can do with that style? We think, you know. Yeah. And uh, now moving a little bit more broadly, um, just in the, I guess, the remaining minutes we have here, one of the things I've been curious about, um, one of the things I'm trying to learn myself is in terms of um, directing voice actors. Um, and I know you mentioned Nora's helped you out a lot in this regard. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the questions I have um, is, I think the thing that surprises me is that a voice actor can come into a booth and bring something that you really just, you really couldn't foresee. Um, you know, let's say you, you, you've read that script a hundred times or you've written that script um, and actors bring something um, that's, that's different, but it works. Um, and you have to be able to recognize like, oh man, that's, that's not what I was thinking, but I like this. Um, do you, 
so sort of push for like, just in case, do what I was thinking, but let's run with this too. How do you, how do you sort of not let those gems get away in the moment? Um, but how do you kind of make sure that when you leave the audio booth, you guys are going to have something um, that you really need? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I think we try not to be too like because we've done we would have done so much work in scratch with like Paul and Nora and different people doing the voices. We've kind of heard it a certain way. And usually if I mean, I've been lucky that I've never regretted casting anyone. But I, I can imagine if you've cast the wrong person, that's when it really that's, that's when you realize oh, I'm just not getting what I had in mind. But usually it's better than what I had in mind when we've cast the right people. And even with kids, it's funny if you've cast a kid just for their natural energy or if you've cast them, you know, for, for what they what they brought to the audition. Usually, if it's not too long after the audition, when you record, you're going to get what you what you thought you were going to get, you know. And with professional actors, they're amazing. Like they, I've worked with some people like Brendan Gleeson or Sean Bean and like. When Sean first started on Wolfwalkers, the first day we were all excited and he was the biggest name in the room and everything. And somehow on the script, we hadn't noticed that there had been a, a little in brackets after the dialogue. Um, you know, he comes in and he says something to Robin and we expected it to be quite light and cheery, but it had managed to make its way through the script that there was still a direction that this was kind of grim or dark. And we were like, oh, this sounds bad oh my god because we'd heard it in scratch so often and in our head so often that he was just saying it in a really light-hearted way like uh i think it was like have you finished your chores or something but it sounded like we were like it sounds like a horror movie because sean bean is like so have you finished your chores <laughs> like really you know like with his accent which i can't do but um and so we were like what's gone wrong and then really we chatted to him about it and then he realized um that he was he had read the script and was following the direction that was written in the script that was maybe an intention a long time ago that we'd let go of but hadn't updated the script and then once we had a chat and got him on the right page and I mean literally that was an hour at the start everything else just flowed and he even offered at the end because he'd kind of gotten to know the character over the few days we were recording to go back and re-record some stuff that he himself felt he could do better having gotten to know the character and I've got stories like that for everyone. I mean, and Brendan Gleeson came in and I had in mind that the dad was a bit, um, you know, teetering on alcoholism. And uh, I had that idea in my head and Brendan didn't like that idea. He felt it was cliched and uh, Irish people have a bad enough reputation. And, <laughs> you know, he didn't want to really do that. And, uh, and I kind of believed in him and I didn't ask him to do a version where he was a drinker. I did it all as just a man who'd locked away his emotions um out of a sort of a, a psychological pain rather than a chemical you know kind of uh, dampening of himself and it was better and we had storyboards and we had model sheets of the father with a little whiskey bottle thing in his hand and we just erased that whiskey bottle because brendan had brought another and he was just right you know he when someone's right you know they're right and a lot of character actors are amazing even if they haven't really done a huge amount of preparation there's a reason why they're the top of their field. They come in and get get their head around it within a half an hour, an hour of chatting to you. And yeah. if they don't, maybe you don't, maybe you're not ready. Like we recorded some dialogue that we had to re-record because we recorded too soon. With the girls, like I remember we did a load of workshopping and we did a whole record of the whole script. And then the script had to be completely rewritten. And a lot of stuff that the girls had been bringing to it that wasn't great made more sense when we rewrote it because the focus hadn't been where it needed to be so sometimes you hear in the voice record oh we need to go back to the script but it's usually your problem not there <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah interesting so i i suppose that probably does that go into some of um casting choices you know so you, yeah. you have these figures who need to be grim but still likable like you know, like um, Sean sure. Bean's character yeah, or Brendan Gleeson. Yeah, yeah, it's so important, isn't it? I mean, and I think I've been lucky because I would have a short list in my head for all the projects and we usually got our top pick, you know, um, and we've been really lucky because you're almost right in the, we definitely wrote Wolfwalkers with Sean Bean in mind. And uh, ironically for Secret of Kells, the first draft of the script had a different uh, protagonist based on Brendan Gleeson and his kind of, 
mentor, his Paduan was Brendan. We kind of got rid of him after Brendan had accepted the role and rewrote it as completely Brendan's story. And then we asked um, Brendan Gleeson to take the part of the, the uncle, you know, Kellogg, who we hadn't cast or didn't have someone in mind for. And uh, it was amazing because he brought the depth and kindness and the sense of a protector that the original protagonist had been into the antagonist, you know, it was kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, well, so I guess in the interest of time, I'll wrap this up here with um, probably two or three more questions. Um, the first one is, you know, when you're, when you're in production, post-production, this is still kind of, um, I guess, related to voice acting. Do you ever, um, you're in the, you're in the booth and you think that's the winner, that's the one. Um, or I don't really like that one, let's do another. But then you get back in post-production or in production, you start laying these things together and you start hearing them. Do you ever change your mind on that sort of initial or have you honed your instincts to sort of like, you can just tell in the booth? Oh no, we, uh, we often would ask the editor to go and look at certain another read if it wasn't feeling right. And um, since the budgets have gone up a bit, we've been doing pickups and things. Sometimes it's hard, like the little boy or he's a young man now, but when he was a little boy, David Rawl did the voice of Ben in Song of the Sea, and we tried to do pickups, but he his voice had changed, so we just had to make the best of what we'd had. Um, but yeah, we've done pickups, especially on Wolf Walkers, we recorded stuff that we realised that maybe the story changed a little bit, our emphasis changed in the storyboarding process after we recorded the voices. Usually record the voices around, you're pretty locked with your animatic, you're pretty sure that's it. And with Wolf Walkers, we unlocked the animatic and rewrote the whole first act, which meant there was quite a few more pickups than usual. Oh, fascinating. <laughs> Uh, and then in terms of budget, um, a, a budget is, is kind of a friend info. I think Chuck Jones always talked about you need limitations because yeah. it's within limitations that things really blossom and bloom. Yeah. Um, and I imagine the budgetary differences um, between your first feature, Secret of Cows, and your, and your last one, Wolfwalkers, is a little bit different. How do you tend to approach um, budgetary restraints? You know, maybe um, do you ever come to a place where we can't reanimate that shot, that, that is how it is, or, or how do you? Yeah, 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 a lot. I think I remember when Paul and I were first working together as students, we would sit down and look at what money we had for whatever freelance job we were doing, and we'd go, let's make a luxury job of the backgrounds because the animation is going to be like on sixes or something, you know? You know, we kind of look where we pick our battles within the budget and cut our cloth kind of, and. And that's, I remember that really well. And that was something that taught as well, I think, to work within our limitations. And what I found difficult in Wolfwalkers was that we had more budget and we could redo things. And I found it tricky because there's a point where you just have to stop. And um, personally, I'm afraid of the budgets getting much higher. I don't think it's all good. I don't even think being able to do everything on ones or full animation is necessarily good. I do think there's something i rather again like i'd rather see something cool and interesting like how i lost my body from france that was made for four million than a 400 million pixar thing where everything has been polished to heck and has to appeal to such a broad audience to recoup its cost that it's become a little bland you know not that pixar is ever bland but you know what i mean sure yep yeah yeah um and then uh i guess uh last question this is just a personal curiosity on my part. Um, when I sat down and watched uh, The Secret of Kells for the first time, uh, I was immediately entranced because <laughs> the character of Ashlyn, the voiceover, she's whispering. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, I was just blown away. I don't think I've ever seen that. What, she's whispering, what's, what's this? What is, um, it's a small thing, it's a small decision, but it, it um, really changes the tone. Um, yeah. I'm just kind of curious, like, <laughs> Where'd that come from? Were you guys like just the whisper opening, now or the opening with the whisper? Yeah, two things came there. First of all, that opening is a re-edit right at the end. It used to open with Brendan Gleason's character, like looking back over his life and remembering Brendan and thinking he's lost everything. And then we would come back to him at the end when Brendan came back. And then we dropped that because it was too heavy and didn't really invite kids in. And then we were recording Kristen 
um, to do play the part. And it always sounded a little bit too theatrical. She was a talented little actor, but it always sounded a bit too theatrical. And Nora just asked her to try whispering it. And then it was like, oh, it's the secret of Kel. She's letting us in on a secret. It had a lot of resonance that way. But it did. It panics a few people. People were like, I can't hear it right. Turn it up. Whoa, it's too loud. But um, yeah, that was just it. I really remember that choice on Nora's part, which is partly why she's such a talented voice director. She found a way to make it work by just a small change, which was whispering it rather than speaking it. Yeah. Tom, thank you so much for your time. You've been oh, really, yeah. really generous. Um, sure, yeah. I'm honored just to speak with you. So thank you so oh, much. Oh, no, thanks a lot. Is that a Glenn Keane drawing behind you? Is that a Tarzan on the page? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, neat. We have one from him too. He made, like in 1999, Nora was an uh, intern in Disney. And uh, he gave us a drawing of Tarzan saying, you know, make it happen. So I love seeing that. Oh, uh, no way. Yeah. She's Amazing. Yeah. Got me this Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope it's as good a talisman for your productions as it has been for us to have a, a Glen oh. Keane Tarzan on the wall. Mm -hmm.